All right. My name is Rebecca Thistlethwaite, and I am the director of the Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network. We're an extension program based at Oregon State University, but we serve a national audience of niche meat producers and processors and other stakeholders in the niche meat supply chain. We put on about five to six webinars a year on topics that our members uh, ask for more information on. And this particular topic on smoke meats and managing a smokehouse is something that a lot of our members have asked for more education around. So I put together this webinar with three experts. We first have Mike Smucker, who owns Smucker's Meats in Pennsylvania. It's a multi-generation family-owned USDA uh, slaughterhouse and processor. Um, and he's got years of experience making excellent quality smoked meats for his farmers. Um, next, we will have Collier Nix, who works for Karis USA. He's based out of Pennsylvania, but today he's joining us on the road uh, from a meat show. And uh, Karis USA is a manufacturer of high quality smokehouses. And then we will have John Froling, who's also with another smokehouse manufacturer called Scott Peck, and he's joining us from South Dakota. John is also the former owner of Froling Meats, which was also a family-run uh, USDA processor that made award-winning um, smoked meat and processed meat products in addition to fresh meats. And uh, he has the distinction of having won over 400 awards for his meat products, including uh, eight years as grand champion bone-in ham at the AMP convention. So we're really excited to bring you these three experts on smoked meats. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then we are gonna start off with Mike Smucker. All right, Mike, see if you can share your screen now. And I should say to our participants, um, we are gonna save questions until the end. But if you do have a question during the presentation, please pop it in the chat box and I'll make sure to get to it at the end. Great. Take it away, Mike. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, not fantastic. Maybe get a little bit closer to your microphone. Okay. It ebbs and flows, but we can hear you. Oh, you could join us through your phone, yeah. Do you know how to do that? I think Mike is going to call in through his phone. There should be a phone number in the Zoom invite. I called him, but I'm not sure if it's coming through or not. You actually sound pretty good. Uh, okay. No, now we can't hear you. Okay, here we go. Let's try that. If it doesn't work, let me know. Okay. okay. Um, all right. Well, um, yes, I am um, one of the owners of Smucker's Meats. Um, I am a third generation. Uh, currently, ownership is with my father, my brother, my mom, and myself. Uh, my grandfather started the business in 1965. And um, yeah, we uh, exist. Uh, we're, we're a custom processor, pay for service. Um, we aren't in any competition and stuff like that, primarily because we're working for the customer, doing whatever the customer wants. So, whatever they bring us is. Uh, what we work with. Um, you can see we've got a, a, a good crew of people um, that uh, help us do this every day. Couldn't do it without them. Um, we have a lot of dedicated people that uh, do a great job at uh, putting out a lot of good products. So, um, but specifically in terms of smoking, um, I think this is one of my favorite sites uh, coming into work in the morning or when the you know, sun's coming up or whatever. And we've got a uh, 
three smokehouses that are uh, pumping out product, and everyone that's outside can see and smell what's going on. Um, but uh, that's uh, always a good thing for me um, because it uh, shows that we're going where we're supposed to be going. Um, but anyway, in terms of smoking and stuff, we've uh, the journey for us has been uh, long and varied. We've been all over the place with uh, stuff. We started out with no smoke houses, and we were getting other plants to smoke product for us. Um, in the mid nineties, um, my father was able to purchase one small smoke house, um, and uh, we. Uh, Kind of grew from there. Uh, it's just one of the small ones that you can see in the picture there. Um, in a couple of years, we were able to purchase uh, another use one that was identical to it. Um, and uh, both of those survived the fire. We were able to pull them out of the, the uh, remains of the building that was left, brought them to the facility that we're at now. Um, within a couple of years, we had uh, we had another one, a larger one. We wanted a little bit more control over what we were doing. Um, the smaller ones ate great hands and bacons, and we were able to do jerky very well. But um, when it came to trying to hold temperature for uh, snack sticks and things like that, we were having a little bit more difficulty. So the larger house um, certainly had more control over what we were doing and how we could control the process. Um, and that was a used house that was with updated controls and stuff. Um, and is it coming through still? Uh, sorry, there is a little bit of reverberation. Um, are you using your phone audio or your computer audio? I had it muted it, but I will. Is it coming through now? Well, there's reverberation. Um, so if hmm. we're using. Oh, that sounds better. Yeah, maybe you just need to get closer. <laughs> okay. Oh, is it coming through okay now? Uh, it ebbs and flows. Sorry. It ebbs and flows. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Anyway, we um, upgraded and uh, got some updated controls that we've got put into it. Um, and then again, a couple of years later, um, we were able to. Removed the older smokehouses uh, with the smaller ones and got three identical ones again. With uh, we tried to match up control. We had a local uh, control company that um, was able to do the smokehouses as well and was able to, to fit new controls into them. They weren't uh, uh, standard with the um, with the smokehouse itself. They were uh, upgraded to what they could do there little touch screen display and stuff like that that I'll show later on. Um, and, uh, hey, that's hey, uh, basically the setup that you see there is pretty much what we have. The photo on the right is a new house that we just, we, we took the, the first large one out um, and two years ago, a year ago, sorry, I'm getting my timeline, my timeline mixed up, uh, we uh, installed um, that house that's a little, it's, it's certainly newer, but a little larger than what we had before. Um, Mike, uh, folks yeah. can't hear you at all. So I'm wondering- you Can't hear me at all. Yeah, I'm wondering if you can just call in on your phone and turn off your Let's audio- Try that again. On your computer. Sorry. Um, if people can't hear you, then <laughs> there's- It's not worth it, yeah. No. Yeah. Um, we can always go to another presenter um, while you're you're working with your system. Okay. Why don't we, sorry about the technical difficulties, why don't we start with uh, Collier next? Why don't you stop sharing your screen, Mike?
so Collier can share his screen. I'll stop sharing. Might have to kill it. Okay, I'll do it. Sorry, everyone, stick with us. We did test all this out last week and it worked perfectly. So. Okay, should I take over here? Yeah, there you go. Sorry. And can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Take it away. Okay. So, um, as briefly mentioned, I'll, I'll get ahead of Mike here a little bit and uh, I'll, I'll do mine first and uh, we'll, we'll get back to him. Um, my name's Collier. I'm with a, uh, with a company called Cares. Um, just a brief background on myself. I, uh, after college, um, I went to a small processing shop in Pennsylvania where I eventually ended up running the production floor. Um, in that same production floor sat one of the oldest Keres machines and therefore we had a good relationship with Germany. Um, we took over the dealership rights for Keres in 2014 and at the same time that's when my employer said hey do you want to go on the road selling and installing commercial grade smoke houses and I said sounds like a challenge I'll be willing to uh, to take up. So since then I've kind of been in a lot of plants. I've from the knowledge I knew uh, running the production floor to what I saw um, at different shops I was going to install at really kind of compounded and uh, got me where I am today doing what I do. So Keres uh, is a German company. They make uh, forced air ovens, um, drying rooms, climatic rooms for your charcuterie stuff, uh, roasting ovens, which would be essentially the same thing, a forced air oven that just doesn't uh, require a smoke generator. So they do piles and piles of product, um, cleaning systems like trolley washers, VMAG buggy washers, but we really won't get into that. And then even larger cleaning systems for the non-food industry, like cleaning car parts and things like that. But again, we'll focus on the smoke houses and the forced air ovens today. Um, all of the equipment from Keras is made in-house. So the moment the first piece of metal is bent to the moment an employee puts the shipping label on it, we handle the entire construction of the machine ourselves. It's not outsourced anywhere else. Um, so it's kind of a cool and unique thing that Keras does. Um, again, they, they do the cooking chambers and the smoking chambers, which is essentially a forced air oven with a smoke generator hooked up to it. Um, the cooking chambers might be a smaller fan capacity, but really they're just for products that you're steam cooking. Uh, so no drying, nothing of that nature. Roasting and baking houses, again, a roasting house, if I put a smoke generator on, it would turn into a smoke, gener uh, smoke house. Um, I put the smoke generator bullet down there because we offer a wide variety of smoke generators. We'll get into that. And uh, drying rooms, climatic rooms, cooking kettles, um, all just kind of a different, uh, a different variety of machines that Keras offers. So um, as far as our smoke houses go, we do small hand load units um, for the small industry. And then we get into bigger machines for the large industry that you see there on the right of your screen. Um, we kind of tackle all sizes of the industry. Um, that would be an even then larger machine that would be two wide and three chambers deep. Um, so really, no matter what the size of the operation, Keras is able to come in and kind of help out a, a multitude of different, uh, different sizes of uh, um, processors. If you're a small market person that's not really pumping out a pile of product, you may choose one of our small industry machines, which on the left there, We'll even put the smoke generator right in the door. It's uh, economically more friendly and it's a better footprint opposed to our large industry machines. That's one of the smallest generators for large industry that we offer, but you can kind of see the difference as you're picking a machine, a generator in the door, which could handle a small amount of product, you know, up to a, a thousand pounds of product that of, of a large diameter bone and ham versus these freestanding remote generators, which truly the, 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 the ability to cook in them is endless. If you could go a four truck, a, an eight truck, whatever, um, the remote generators can be built to any size. So that's kind of a, an interesting thing that Keras and, and some other guys do is remote generators versus build into the door for small industry guys. So it's, it's sometimes it's difficult to, to decide what smokehouse is right for you. And uh, to answer that question is not always as simple as, well, we wanna make a thousand pounds of sausage every five hours. It, it never really is that uh, is that easy, especially with the small processors, because you're doing hams, bacon, sausage, et cetera, et cetera. So we first, we want to ask what types of products are you doing and how much of that you'll be doing. But really, it comes down to a lot more things. Many, when I'm sizing a machine, I have to look at the size of the room you're bringing it into. 
what door can I come through? What ceiling height do I have? Everyone wants the biggest machine, but if you, if you can't get the machine in and it's gonna cost you a fortune to adjust your building, you may have to get two smaller machines opposed to one big one. Those are all kind of factors that come in. We do have tables that calculate, okay, if you wanna make this much of this, this much of that, you need this machine, but a lot of the times it's irrelevant because it comes right back down to that building size and what you can handle. Um, furthermore, people always wanna size their machine. Well, we think this will do it. You should size your ma machine according with your busiest season. Us in Pennsylvania uh, doing a pile of deer every year, if we're pumping out hams and turkeys for Thanksgiving and we have all these deer flooding in, our machine was sized accordingly to handle that. So when you're sizing your machine for throughput purposes, make sure you're sizing during your busiest season. Um, additionally, think about how your smokehouse can replace other equipment. When we were uh, running the shop there in Pennsylvania, we did a pile of catering. And we took an oven and would put hotel pans in that oven and reheat in, the, in, a, in a small oven in the catering kitchen. And we eventually decided, let's put those same hotel pans on uh, screens and heat them up in the smokehouse when the smokehouse wasn't being used. But be careful that you're not uh, impeding your processing room from cooking their product by commingling, catering, and other, other things. Um, cook tanks are another good example. We love to see cook tanks as they're a very efficient way to cook. But... And you can do that product in the smokehouse, but just realize that if you're cooking Fleischwurst or minced bologna or something like that in your smokehouse via a steam cook, you're losing time that you can cook other products. So see where you can fit it in and what you can replace and what you can afford to replace. Um, so now you've picked the right size machine and you know what you want to cook in it. Um, a very important thing is to determine the fuel source you're going to bring it. Electric is generally the easiest, but it's also the most expensive as far as running goes. Kilowatt hours for electric are gonna be much higher. Kilowatt cost per hour for electric is much higher than gas. But at the same time, steam and gas are much, much cheaper running costs, but to get them installed and the overhead cost of the machine itself, um, the maintenance on the machine, things like that can, can really add up. So if, if you're making a move on a new system, really look at what you can get gas for, if you want to get a steam house, they generally cost the, the least amount to run, but to get a boiler and to get the pipe network for all that stuff set up can cost a fortune. So as you're picking a house, what fuel source you're bringing is hugely important. Really, really look into that. And as far as the fuel source, uh, the airflow, um, if you're cooking nothing but beef jerky, for example, you may look at something called a horizontal system, which is going to move uh, air left to right. If you're cooking nothing but vertically hung product, bacon, hams, sausage, things of that nature, a vertical system may do it for you. Nowadays, um, most systems will incorporate both via flaps and things of that nature, different fan speeds to mix the air in a certain way. And we, we specifically call ours the hybrid system. Um, a manipulation of airflow in, this, in the same house, you can be cooking screen salmon, and then the next day you're cooking vertically hung ham. And it, the, the possibilities are endless in those vertical or uh, hybrid houses. So now we're kind of getting back to the smoke generators. Um, I'll touch briefly on this. Uh, determining which smoke you're going to use can be can be very uh, very challenging at some points. I can I have the ability to put all three of them on our house, but some people, mainly for insurance purposes, will go with liquid smoke. If you've had a fire and and your insurance says, listen, you're not putting another live burning generator in the in the room, they'll go with liquid. Um, a sawdust system, which is also closed, just like liquid, a closed uh, system, which has fresh air and exhaust closed. If I have a customer in Las Vegas that wants to put a smokehouse in the middle of Las Vegas, well, they're not going to be allowed to pump smoke out into the environment nonstop all day, every day. They need to utilize a closed system, which is going to smoke for so long and then exhaust for a minimal amount of time. If you're out in the middle of nowhere and you want the fastest smoking times and, um, you want to really, really, like if people that are coming out of a block house, a, a cinder block gravity house, we won't even offer them a, a closed system. You want the, the most smoke you can possibly get. We'll give them an open system. So look at the products you're trying to make. Look at the smoke level you want. Ask the supplier to give you, your smokehouse supplier, to give you um, customer's product to determine the level of the smoke you want and the flavors you want. Because depending on the depending on the product, what people explain to me what they want, I will judge the generator we're going to get them accordingly. So another important thing to look at. So you've got the right size house, uh, you've got the right fuel source, you've got the right airflow in the generator. Now, many times we see people run into a huge snag is understand what costs and what effort is coming up, coming down the pipe. 
um, shipping and shipping of the machine can be a reasonably high amount of money, a few grand if it's coming out of Europe, like ours machine, our machines are. Uh, rigging, generally speaking, um, you know, I, I would like to see the machine stood up and in place. When I come to install, I want that machine up and in place, and I'm coming to test the oven and program it. My time is best utilized programming, not standing up a machine. So when we get there for what's generally a three-day install and the machine is laying on the floor in the parking lot, um, it, it just makes it tricky for us to do the most, the most efficient uh, install that I can do. Uh, furthermore, chimney, electric, um, compressed air, remote compressors, all these things add up to a, to a reasonably high cost, and you should understand that when you're, when you're getting into it and buying a machine. Um, not only is the cost of the chimney and all these things expensive, but the way you do it is expensive as well. Uh, for example, a chimney, um, many people go to avoid structures in the building and they'll put bends and turns in their chimneys. And we see this and say, you, you just can't do it for the best results on the machine. Give us a straight chimney. Every bend and every restrictive chimney cap and all that stuff is the equivalent of putting a potato in your tailpipe of your car. It restricts airflow and then hurts the machine's ability to work. Um, electric. If you know you're running an electric house, bring a, bring main power from the panel to a disconnect box and then have a service loop of wire sitting there waiting. So when the machine gets there and is stood up, you have a half a day to connect and then I can come and immediately install. If the machine gets there and you start the process of getting all these things installed, you could be looking at a pile of extra time. You could be a month out waiting for chimney stuff to arrive and contractors to get there and et cetera, et cetera. And another thing people fail to look at often is code requirements. What's code going to want to see on your chimney? How far can your control cabinet be from any, you know, a wall? You need to have three feet off a control cabinet. So just pay close attention to what codes is going to want to see. Um, I'll go through this kind of quickly because I think John is really going to hit on this stuff. He's got some great info on this. Um, you've got this perfect smokehouse. You've got it up and in. Now we got to cook some product and make the right cycle. Um, different fan speeds, different temperatures, different uh, levels of humidity will, will are really used in different applications. Um, for standard product, ring bologna, smoked sausage, things like that, the general idea is the same on the cycle. And then you get into your specialty products, which are fermented and beef jerkies and all these different things. But I'll just focus briefly on, on the standard product, um, what we want to see the machine do and how I'll program it. Um, generally speaking, this cycle that you see right here, um, is, is a good approach for all, all standard products. Again, your ring bolognese and your hams and stuff. Uh, first, we preheat the oven, then we preheat the product to a core of sometimes 80, sometimes up to 105 degrees. Uh, reason being, it's, it's quite similar to a cold can of soda on a hot day. If you take it outside, that can is gonna condensate and sweat. So we will try to heat the product up a little bit to make this step three fast drying a little more efficient. Um, in an open system, this hot smoke, fast dry hot smoke would just be one step. You'd smoke right through because you're exhausting the humidity as you go. In a closed system, you'll see that I'm staging it. I have to exhaust in between because as I'm closed smoking, I'm building humidity. You have to exhaust that because the humidity, oh, the humidity will adhere to the product. And now you're going to smoke that humidity and not the, the moisture and not the product itself. Um, step seven is a dry cook. Very important to set your colors. And step eight is a roasting on ground products. You generally want to be nice and gentle with convective heat transfer, the level of humidity, till you get to a certain point. That way you know you're bound up, you're, 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 you've achieved a good bind before you get very aggressive and move into a, 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 a high heat, high humidity cooking step. Um, then you would shower the product. Showering is responsible to uh, relax the, the, the water in the product. It's, uh, the water is moving and, and bumping around. You want to cool the product as quickly as you can to keep as much water in. And then our machines are, are built with refrigeration right in them. So I can, uh, I can move right into a refrigeration step and chill the product down to packing temperature. Um, but again, refrigeration is, is a cool thing we can do. But you don't want to, if you're waiting to put another product in, um, you don't want to tie the house up with, with product to refrigerate. Um, I'm getting close here on time. So these are just some products we do. This is a cool picture I like to show because this one bacon was finished with some humidity. The one on the left, you see how it got a little bit darker. Um, one on the right is finished without humidity. So you can see how humidity plays a role on uh, making some products darker. Those are some good looking hams. Um, that's a, a nice turkey that again, um, that's smoked for 40 minutes in our system and it's finished with some humidity. So it really, really darkens up. That's some
screen. It's a consistent product to the house. I can't give you a consistent product out of the house. Meat blocks of, you know, Mike, when he gets back on, will, will tell you that it's difficult when you have custom product with varying levels of fat, they act differently. A higher, a leaner product will hold on to moisture better than a, than a fattier product. Um, we constantly see people, uh, and first thing in the morning, they're pulling a trolley out of a 30 degree cooler, and that product goes into the house at 30 degrees internal temperature. And then later in the day, they load a house that's got a little bit hotter meat block in. Those two products are going to cook uh, differently. So consistency and mixing time is huge. If you're not mixing the same way every time, the, the, the bind will be different. And uh, it just gets a, little, uh, gets a little tricky for the house to produce a consistent product if you don't bring a good product to the house. And maintenance and safety, um, this goes without saying, cleaning is, is huge. If your house has an, uh, an incorporated cleaning, um, make sure you're using it. It's, it's hard on the machine. It's hard on the working parts. It, it, deteriorates the house much, much quicker. Check your outputs, keep your probes calibrated, things of that nature are, are hugely important. So thank you. Thank you, Collier. And uh, he will pop his contact information in the chat box if you guys want to get a hold of him. Um, next up, we're going to try Mike again. He's joining us by phone this time. And let's see if he can load his uh, slideshow again. Mike, are you with us? Ready. Okay. I, there we go. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. I am back on computer audio. I was on the phone, but nothing's coming through. Oh, uh, you're not joining us by phone? Yeah, I am. Well, I'm, I'm trying to, but the, the audio is not coming through. <laughs> okay. Um, trying to try just continue trying computer audio again. So your phone audio is not working. Yeah, not very well on your phone. You're not hearing. Uh, yeah, but it's still poor. Okay. Um, well, I think that we will probably just go to John and then okay. maybe try to reschedule a webinar with you um, at a later date. Uh, John, do you yep. want to go ahead? Okay. Can you see everything all right? Yep, it looks great. Take it away. And you, you can cool. have a little bit more time. <laughs> Uh, maybe 20 minutes because uh, Mike is unable to, to present. No problem. Well, I'm going to spend a little time with introduction just briefly so you kind of know. Um, so I started uh, Furling Meats Inc. in 1997, but my father had the family owned business since 1962. Uh, we were in the back of a Jack and Jill grocery store. If anybody went to the Midwest, you would go. Uh, so we slaughtered cattle in the back, and in 97, uh, we built a new building. So I, from 97 then to 2015, when I um, sold our business, we had won over 400 state and national awards on sausage. And when we had bought the smokehouse, we obviously bought the Scott Peck brand, and uh, it was kind of life-changing for us. So what I kind of want to go over, uh, Collier did an awesome job kind of explaining, you know, what's out there in industry now for these new ovens. And it's been a great time for both of us as far as everybody is having to switch up, you know, the 20-year-old technology just doesn't cut it anymore. Uh, so we can see yield gains from 10 to 22% on average from the older ovens that you guys are working with to what we're selling today. And what I'd like to spend some time with is the problems that I see 
with industry, not just typically with your older ovens, because after living it for 25 years and operating some of the older ovens, there's some things that you can do to help your yields. So I'm gonna go through my slide presentation relatively quickly. We'll show a little bit of kind of the Scott Peck ovens and then talk about the problems I see and some things you can do with your, your older equipment to help you. This is one of our um, vertical flow ovens that I have the, the drip pan out so that you can see we have the turbine up in the top and everybody needs a, a basic understanding of what the ovens do. In this case, case the, the fan will blow the air up into the hood of the oven. It'll come down through the cones that you see. And then you would have to obviously imagine the truck is in there. It comes down, hits its break point on the floor. And that's why the, the cones that are in there, the air comes in different places, hits the floor, comes back up through the center of the product. And what Collier and I have as far as an advantage to some of the industry ovens, and I'm not here to do a sales pitch. I just want to explain what the European style ovens having a square truck historically gives us a little bit better consistency and that our, our hot and cold spots in the house are pretty much non-existent because we can positively pressurize that chamber and the cart is not longer, um, it's the same distance from the fan either way. So the European oven design, I think is probably the best thing out there. So with that being said, we hit our break point and that air has to go back into the top. Okay, we're gonna show just briefly a horizontal flow oven. Um, so I would recommend this is, we have both the oscillating type, like Collier said, and this would be a horizontal oven that would be strictly for screens only. Um, so your truck would go in there and there's basically a, a screen between each one of these layers coming out of the house. So what we do is we open up, let's say the right side of the house and the air will come from right to left, then run 15 seconds, it'll close, come from left to right for 15 seconds. Now remember this typically only works with anything on screens because if you would have a hanging product in this oven, everything that's on the right or left side of the truck is gonna get abused with the air um, pretty bad. It will work, but not recommended because your yields are not there. But just so you can see the different types of ovens that are out there. So this is looking at the side wall, air comes from right to left, and then the damper closes on the right and comes from left to right. So this is where I'd like to spend most of our time today is kind of, it's really important that you guys understand the cook cycles. And from 20 years ago, you know, when our, and, and to honestly, some of the companies still to this day, when the book comes, it was updated in the 80s and 90s, ironically. And I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, but I did. Just want to just Collier did a great job of explaining this, but the preheat step is probably the most important one that we can talk about in the beginning. So in this particular case, when we preheat the oven, the dampers are closed. We're trying to hit a chamber temperature of 135 degrees. And we want to run that for 15 minutes. Now, after, depending on some products, I'll once we start to customize, when I'm at the plant setting the, the customer up, I like to make sure that we hit a certain internal temperature. And what that does is this. Let's say we bid 150 pounds on half the truck and then we filled the rest of the truck after break. Well, now you have within that one truck, two different temperatures of product. And we need to make sure that that truck is equal before we start the drying process. So as Collier was talking, you know, you that first truck in the morning, you bring it out of the cooler and that product's 30 degrees. The next one you stuff has to wait for a house to get done or two, there can be 15, 20 degrees difference between starting those houses. And the one thing that we do a lot better with the newer equipment than the older ones is this drying cycle is relatively short. From 10 to 12 minutes on a, a cell, you know, a plastic stuffed hot dog as far as into a peelable casing, and then up to 30 minutes in the natural. If we try to you know, put product in that isn't at the right temperature or isn't consistent, 
if we miss our window on drying, we can't go back. So then you might end up with some product in the middle of the truck that might be slightly muddy because we didn't have the proper drying time. So it's so important for that preheat step or what we call the reddening step, dampers are closed, that product is gonna be really wet and sweaty when we open the dampers to start the drying process. But I would say if I could tell you one thing that you're doing, if you're looking at your oven cycles right now and you're just going right to a drying step, you really should close that oven off Make sure that you bring that product up to a certain temperature before you start the drying process. Within the oven, I, was to, I would ever go back, I would never have an oven that you don't have control of the fan speeds. So in this second step, we're at a drying two uh, for our ovens. One in any stage is a slow fan, two is fast, okay? So we wanna dry the product as fast as we can to try to not evaporate any more moisture out of the center of the product because in this business, we need to be water managers. We want to make money, right? So we want to try to get that product sealed up, bind that water, and make sure we have a nice, tender, juicy product for our customer. So for us, we dry it and until we, I like to see the moisture or the humidity in the oven down in the you know, low 20s to teens, we start the smoking cycle. Um, so when Collier talked about smoke, we have an ignition step for four minutes, and then we go right to smoking. So with our ovens, we too have to break that smoking cycle because when you start the smoking process, if your humidity rises, especially if we get close to 50%, we're gonna start getting water vapor that's attaching to smoke. And then what happens is, is we get, it still does a beautiful job, it gives you a nice color, but you'll get a little bit more of a pitchy flavor from it so it can get strong. So the humidity is really critical during the smoking process so that we don't, have too much flavor profile um, or make it so that you burp it later on. So we smoke for 10 minutes that usually in that first smoking cycle that humidity will rise. Sometimes we'll get up to 40 to 50 percent then we'll do a quick five minute discharge where we just open the dampers, dump the, the smoke out that usually brings that humidity back down to 19 or or a little less right away and then we start the smoking cycle again. Typically on that second smoke cycle, we don't have that humidity rise as much because we got any residual humidity out of the oven. And then I like to see about a 35% humidity during the smoking process for that part. After that, we do a discharge. For us, that simply it's a drying two-step. Um, the only thing is we're actuating the, the stirring arm in the generator to make sure that all the unburned chips are down and it's ready for the next one. And then I do a drying two step, which is your color set step. Uh, meanwhile, we always have to watch our temperature to make sure that our internal temperature comes up at a decent rate. But for most of our cycles, this one's pretty consistent. And then the last thing I wanna talk about that is very, very important is, as you see, we get to step nine. If you look at cook one, we have a 15 minute set, but we're cooking with Delta cooking. And what that simply is, is you can see my chamber temperature is at 155 degrees. As soon as I hit a core temperature of 135, I automatically go to the next step. So, and we'll get to this in the next slide so you understand it. Then we go 160, 140. So typically with a small diameter sausage, I'll have about 20 degrees to 15 degrees difference, depending on how fast I wanna bring that product up. And you can see I start at 60% humidity and I finish at 99. Um, with some items, I don't care to go as high as 180, depending on what kind of fat we have. And it seems to be with the pork nowadays, with the unsaturated fat from the distiller's grain, I usually try to finish at 175 because with the high humidity in the end, you can get some rendering effect if you aren't really careful. So that finishes then. So this whole program takes two hours and five minutes on average, maybe a little less. We shower for 15 minutes and, and we're done. So with that being said, I'm gonna to go to this next slide. And this is the most important thing that I can explain to you guys right now, is whenever you look at this, and the only line I really need you to be concerned with right now is the red line. You have to make sure on these charts that when you print a chart out that that red line is constantly going uphill. If it ever flatlines or continues to go straight, you're just wasting time in the smokehouse and all your money is going out the chimney. So if one thing that you get out of anything we've done today, just remember that when we cook this product off, if that line isn't going consistently uphill, your money is going out the chimney. Okay, so here's a, just a simple, this is looking at one of the screens on our smokehouse. Um, just a quick 
pitch to the newer equipment that's out there. One you can see on the left hand side where you go under cycle time, that's my set point. Obviously I just started the house so it hasn't ran off any time yet. I set the chamber at 135, you know, it's gonna be, it's at 110, humidity's at zero. So the nice thing about these type of screens on the newer ovens is you can walk by, you can look and you know if everything is perfect. You don't have to wonder if uh, everything is running properly. So it's really nice. And, and the one thing I wanna touch on is humidity is so important. So if you have an older oven where you have a wet bulb, dry bulb setting, so you're setting your chamber at 150 and if you set it at 130, 140, we're, we're expecting to have 65% humidity. Well, that's in theory, unless you can prove it. You know, these ovens tell you exactly where, you know, what your humidity is. And it's important that you have that ability because you could run for a whole year and realize that, hey, I, I could never achieve higher than 40 or 50% humidity, which really affects your, your bottom line. So very important. Uh, and if you're not a mechanical type person, and I'm sure Collier would agree with me after we've traveled this many years and being in different people's plants, it's unbelievable that you know some people have a gift in every different part of business. If the mechanics of that smokehouse aren't your, your gift, make sure you spend a hundred or 200 bucks every couple months to have somebody come in that knows what they're doing because I can gain you a hundred dollars a load. And if you're not getting the humidity numbers you need, it's very important for for functionality and for good product to make sure that these things are functioning correctly. Same thing here, now we're down on a cook, we're running slow fan. So depending on, um, I just wanted to put this in there. So when I finish, I typically run on a slower fan, depending on the product. So sometimes I like to push a lot more air in there, but in this situation on our cook steps, the, the dampers are closed. So depending on what we're doing, I like to save a little energy. Um, timing seems to be pretty close to the same unless I'm running a jerky product or something where I want to keep pushing a lot of air so we don't have any humidity buildup. So in this situation, a cook one slow fan is what we're finishing and you can kind of see set point is in the green, actual temperatures are on the right. Um, I always have to put this slide in there, it's hard to fathom, uh, but I'm still literally once a month I'm in a plant and they don't even know what a wet sock is. So this is your psychrometer pan or your humidity pan. The top probe in this picture is your dry bulb temperature or whatever the chamber is running at. The bottom probe is your wet bulb. When that sock is on there and it is wicking water out of the bottom, the difference between these two is the one, the relative humidity in there and really the bottom probe should be mimicking what the surface of your product is. So if you are not changing them, and I know some companies tell you to change them every batch, well, that is probably a little bit over overstated, but I'm here to tell you that you really need to watch these and you need to make sure that you do it weekly or every two weeks for sure, depending on your volume. And then if you ever see a time in a, when a house is running and the humidity is reading 95 to 99%, typically that thing has got crusted up and uh, it needs to be changed because it no longer can wick water which means that anything you're calling for in humidity is already met because the oven is reading 99%. So very important. Um, and it is truly ironic to me that I'll go into plants all the time that don't even know they've been running an oven, an older oven for years and didn't even know they needed the sock on there. So um, very important. Humidity is done in several different ways. Um, ours, we atomize water with air here, so we shoot it into a vapor form, similar to a vapor machine that you would put beside your bed if you have a cold. That way we don't have all that water going onto your heating elements. Um, works very well, steam generator also works well, but this seems to, for most of our customers, easily be able to achieve 95 to 98%. Um, does a great job. Another problem when I come in and do a consulting job or something, if they have an older oven, this needs to be checked um, with every batch that you or every time you clean your oven because with hard water deposits depending on the kind of oven and what kind of nozzle they had on there it's very common for it to get plugged up and because it's underneath the drip pan in the oven you don't see it so uh, it's very important to make sure this is done every time you clean the oven here's just some pictures and i want to get into loading um, and, and this is probably the biggest thing i'll see and i'm sure collier would agree with me so these are bellies um, that we, you know, we cook and we're going to talk about several different products. Um, these ovens are phenomenal, especially the newer ones, but it's only as good as the guy putting the product on the, on the truck. So 
Typically on a full size truck, uh, we can put five to 600 pounds of bellies. Depending on their weight, that's eight to nine uh, per, per stick. So three across, three sticks across the top and bottom. So usually 54 bellies or a little bit less depending on how big they are. That gives us plenty of airflow to get between them. Um, and I'll talk about loading real quick. It's really important. So in the next picture, this is one of our smaller ovens and you can see he put 400 pounds on that one. So it did a great job. It was, you know, awesome. But the problem is that you had to extend your drying time to the point where you're going to lose some yields. So it's really important for you guys to understand that you can pack an oven, we can make it work and it'll get done. But to maximize the yields and get the product out in a consistent time, you can't overpack the oven. So here's um, this customer was in North Dakota. Half of that rack is potato sausage. That's the lighter color. I want you to uh, to see on the left, you know, it's pretty evenly spaced. As long as I have one to two between there, the air can get through there great. It works awesome. You, the truck on the right, you can see that he's starting to stagger those sticks. So you, you put a row on the top and then you set a, another stick in between those. Well, now that air doesn't have a free free flow through there. So you're gonna have, once again, it'll do a great job, but you're gonna have to spend a little more time drying and the yields won't be as good on that product. Okay, and then I'll talk one more before I get to the questions. You know, Collier showed that the jerky product that works phenomenally well. You just have to make sure that air is gonna come down, it hits its break point, and it has to, if you're running a vertical oven, it has to have some way to get between that jerky. So when you're putting ground and form jerky or whole muscle jerky on there, it's not like you're putting a puzzle together to try to plug every hole on there because you're just creating a situation where that air has nowhere to get through the cart. So I've been in some Jack Lynx plants. They'll have an inch around all that product on their older vertical flow ovens. And the reason for that is they just, it has to have a place for that air to get in there. And it's so important, especially with jerky and some of those products that when that, when that load is done and you pull it out, we can't afford to go back and have a second cook step. So we want to make sure that we get it all done. Our water activity is good. If you start packing the oven or not being consistent on loading, we have a situation where the uh, water activity will be messed up and then you might have two screens on there that have to go back for a second cook, especially with the older ovens. So very important to, to go through and, and give yourself a little room on those trucks. And it always happens, and the last thing I wanna talk about is filling the top of the truck first. So as you're putting your sausages, anything on there, remember to always fill the top of the oven first because it's the most important part. So and especially with the, the trucks that Collier and I sell, those trucks are 79 inches tall. So it's easier for your employees to fill the bottom first. But if you leave two feet on the top, air is considered just like water. So as that air comes down the side of the house, if it can leach across because there's nothing there forcing it to go down the side of the truck, it, it will do that. And you'll have some inconsistencies in cooking. So fill the top of your houses first. Make sure it's even all the way at top and then the air can come down. Even if you have a short load, always fill the top up first. So with that, I guess I ran through quick. As far as functionality ovens, we, we kind of offer everything very similar. So I would love to you know, ask, answer questions if I can. Thank you so much, John. Um, Collar, how about you unmute yourself and you can share your video as well. Uh, Mike Smucker will, will have to redo his presentation at another time due to technical difficulties. So sorry about that, but we still have a couple uh, great experts here in the panel. So folks listening, it's your opportunity now to pop questions into the chat box. Um, while you're doing that, uh, one question I have for both of you is, how do you guys um, maintain process control in the evenings and on the weekends in these smokehouses? Is it all um, automatic data logging or does it require um, some people to come in and check on things? Um, you, on, on John and I's system, um, I'm sure there's remote, uh, there, I know there is on ours and John, I'm sure there is on yours that you can remote in and look at it via one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, generally the holdup on weekend and overnight cooking is if you're cooking over the weekend, you need to have an employee coming in to take trolleys out and put new trolleys in. Mm -hmm. um, you can control the ovens 
even on your phone in, in most instances. So starting and stopping and checking and looking is no problem. And John showed you a cook log that was probably written right by by your microprocessor. Mm -hmm. So the new ovens you will, will track and, and store all that data right there for you. And again, generally the holdup is someone coming in to load and unload the machine. And maybe John has some more on that. Yeah, it's just, you know, very, the biggest thing is that anything that you can have done the day before, um, that's stuff while your inspector's there, you can cook all weekend long, as long as you have that, but it has to be on the trucks and you typically can't package it till, you know, your inspector is back on site. Yeah, so everything has to be prepared and on the trucks during inspection hour, but you can move trucks in and out on the weekend, and then you can't put them into packages until that inspector gets back on Monday. Is that correct? So you just have them sitting. Where where do you where do you store them while while you're waiting? Just a cooler. So you would have it ready to eat cooler, your finished product cooler for for your cook stuff and then your raw cooler for the products waiting to go to the house. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, an, and if an inspector is telling you otherwise, I mean, we have piles of customers that say, oh, well, we can't cook during the weekend. Our inspector isn't here and he says we can't do it. Don't be afraid to challenge your inspector gently. Don't get yourself into a, a fight with them, but <laughs> just ask them to see it. Uh, you know, again, we've seen multiple people who wouldn't cook overnight because they couldn't, they, they, they thought they were not allowed to do so. And, and we kind of said, well, listen, let's talk to a supervisor. Let's talk to that person. And uh, so bottom line, if, if you're hearing something that you don't agree with, don't be afraid to ask for proof or validation of what an inspector might be telling you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Mike Smucker actually sent me the FSIS guideline on um, process, you know, overnight and weekend, um, smokehouse processing and so I can send that to uh, all our attendees and if your inspector is giving you um, other information you can just pull that out and say well here's your guideline um, so yeah that's always an option for people and do it in a in a non-confrontational non way um, let's see any questions from the audience while I'm waiting for people to ask questions, um, can both of you guys share a little bit uh, about pricing for your units? What's sort of the the low end model pricing, and and then you know for sort of an average small processor that's maybe processing ten to fifteen head a day, um, what would a unit for something a scale like that cost? I would say for ours, uh, we would start at roughly 50, 52,000 and then up to a normal single truck house would be at 76 to 80. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then multiple trucks compound. Mm -hmm. And does that include like installation costs as well? Uh, we do have an installation cost. So I usually typically I'm with the customer for four days at least until he is comfortable and I put all the programs in for them. So that is over and above. That includes the CIP system, uh, microprocessor, smoke generator, everything included. How about you, Colin? In, in my presentation, I showed uh, our small industry and our large industry. Um, that, that little guy with the smoke generator in the door the smallest one of the, that we would offer would be a uh, would be what we'd call a twelve fifty. Mm -hmm. uh, that machine installed with the smoke trader in the door comes right around fifty grand. Mm -hmm. um, and then a thousand pound cart unit with a freestanding generator and stuff like that mm -hmm. would come in installed around ninety. The only thing that varies for us is again shipping. When we when we quote a machine, we're we're quoting generally fully loaded, so everything sold with the everything that we would offer is is included cooling refrigerator uh, refrigeration shower uh heating to 350 etc cetera, etc cetera. um the only thing that's not included in our pricing again is shipping so that's because we just don't know what it is until the machine is ordered and we know where it's going mm -hmm. ours is a sales. i do have a couple questions that have just come in uh, Laura asked, as someone brand new to this type of finished product that is very small, what advice do you have? It sounds like newer equipment is better than older. Any other advice? 
You want to start, John? Here's what, you know, there are some of the reasons that I did what I did and started with the companies. Once you see the difference on yields, um, if you're in the startup and you can afford it, I would absolutely tell you that the smokehouse is going to make you more money. Um, sometimes it's as much from what they are currently running now, it's $150 to $200 a load that they'll make just on yield gains, depending on the product. So it is huge in that instance to absolutely, if you can afford it, uh, I always tell people, and even though I sell awesome grinders, uh, that I would rather buy a $2,500 grinder and put my money into the smokehouse first, and then obviously the stuffer, which I don't sell, <laughs> but those two pieces of equipment are what really make you get where you need to go. So the smokehouse being first, uh, the, the yield gains alone for somebody starting out, that would be our ride spend the most money. What if you don't have enough product to even fill up the house? Is that just uh, an inefficient use of the house? For sure, it's a, you know, you're, it doesn't really affect, especially if we, as we talked about Delta cooking, if we continue to cook that way, even a small load, our drying times will change slightly, but the rest of the process will be functionally the same. Mm -hmm. It's just that you're using energy for a small amount of product. Mm -hmm. So I find it hard to believe that anybody that if you were just doing custom, for sure, we would need to talk about, you know, that, but if you're doing any type of retail at all, I think you would always be able to fill you know, the oven. Collier, any advice for very small newbies? Um, it, buying used equipment is always attractive. It, it's generally a lower price tag, but it's kind of similar to buying a car. It's not going to have, I don't even like to call them bells and whistles because it's, it, that's, that's like an excessive term. Um, the data logger, the printout that John showed you, the, the ability to move air, you know, the wet bulb and humidity tracking, all that stuff. But furthermore, when you buy a used car, there's a more than likely chance that you're going to be replacing an engine soon and you're going to be replacing this and replacing that. So they have the tendency to fail a little more. Mm -hmm. And now you're putting uh, a bunch of expensive new stuff on a used machine that's just going to continue to fail. So the attractive price tag up front is, uh, is of course, something to look at. But if you, if you look at everything you're going to put into it then and, and rebuilding it, it, uh, it quickly adds up to maybe sometimes pretty close to what you would pay for a new machine. Mm -hmm. um, as far as partial loading, to, to add on to what John said, um, if you really are gonna partially load, of course it's not as efficient uh, economically, but we all sometimes, if I know someone's doing it, I'll give them a full batch cycle and I'll give them a half batch cycle. Mm -hmm. If I'm not employing a Delta T cook, like John is saying, I know that a half load is gonna take half the time to dry or a third of the time to dry. If I know the customer is doing that, I'll just say, okay, rather than the customer having to come over and manipulate the cycle of time, I'll just give them a second program for a half a cook that they can use that in, in one time and a full load the next. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, Pat asked, if your smoker doesn't have a shower cycle, is there another technique to do that? Maybe a lower tech, uh, lower tech method? So we had one oven <clears throat> that we tried to, when we were really busy, we would actually pull the product out hot and we built a little shower room off the side just simply to be able to run the next product in there hot without cooling the oven down and keep, you know, the product going much quicker. So really you're either that or you're going to have to spray it with the hose. And what people have to remember is if they pull product out of the oven hot without showering it, it's going to contract you know, as soon as that hits the, the room temperature, it's going to contract and it's going to shrivel or, or have wrinkles in it, mm -hmm. just like a raised. It's not quite that severe, but in some instances, they like that because it gives you an artisan look. But for the most part, it's not usually, depending on the product, as attractive. So typically the shower is very important, but you can build one very simple with, you know, just a, a shower head and a hose going to it, mm -hmm. put it in an area where it's free and clear of everything and just turn it on so it's covering the whole truck and uh, it's just important to get water on there so it doesn't shrivel. Collier, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I see that next question coming in from Michael. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, exactly what John said. The two things we would do is, is build out of PVC pipe or anything, just like a, a, a frame that would be um, 
I see that my connection's unstable. I don't know if you guys are seeing that. Um, yeah, I a frame you. or something that you would push the trolley under and then feed water into that PVC pipe and it would just spray water all over the product. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have that option, um, just a cold uh, uh, nozzle with your hose to just spray it with cold water. Um, but uh, explaining the shower in the smokehouse, it's just nozzle spraying. But again, we do that because the water molecules at a high temperature, just like you boil water at home, they're, they're, you literally see the boiling water moving. The water is bouncing around and moving all over the place. So the quicker you can cool it, you'll slow the water molecules down and decrease their movement, and then it's less to move out of the product. You'll, you'll retain it inside the product. That's why we do it, and that's some different options to do it. Okay. Or, oh, I'm sorry, one more thing. I will have people, uh, in German, in Europe, it's very popular for them to take sticks off the tree and move it into a cold water bath. But we like to, uh, if you don't move it into a cold water bath, it sometimes is a little more efficient cooling if you can get some air movement through it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Even when they put it in a cold water bath, they're constantly working it and moving it to get some action on it, to move stuff around to, uh, um, you know, promote efficient cooling. Larger products can actually, it's now we're getting into something tricky but a large product will form like a cool shell on the outside of it and you'll trap the heat on the inside mm -hmm. so interval showers and different things like that it, it all depends on the product and, and how fast you need to cool it and your options to even do so uh we have time for maybe one or two more questions um since i don't see any, i was going to ask ask one uh where do you guys turn to for like the best list of validation studies for smoke products? Is there sort of a one-stop shop? Would that be University of Wisconsin? Or is there somewhere that you go to help your processors find validation studies? Well, unfortunately, most of them are still using Appendix A, um, which is it's great, but you know, the document was not built for what we all do down here. So, um, and obviously they're working on that, but they just suspended it. So who knows? Um, there's certainly Wisconsin would be a great source. Um, and I would always recommend to try to, you know, as you do your HACCP plans, you really have to research that so you understand. Some of them are very simple, but depending on as you get into no nitrate products and items like that, uh, those come up times and cool down times become very, very tough to meet, especially on larger diameter products. So um, Wisconsin would be a starting point. And then of course the AMP organization would be the first place that I would go to spend money to, to make sure that you're prepared. Does AMP help, help you find studies or do they have a, a archive? They, they have all that information and Chris is very knowledgeable about that and they have people that we can, you know, if you have a question, they would help you find the correct answer or at least call some processors that give you a starting point of what they're using. Mm -hmm. Collier, do you have any anything to add? Yeah, generally speaking, the 1999 Appendix A, if you Google it, you'll find immediately the times and the temps you need to hit. Um, and like John said, they just suspended this new one they released in 2017. It was um, it was pretty open for interpretation, to put it gently. It was not a, a very solid document. And just like we were talking about with people moving product in and out of a smokehouse outside of inspected hours, if you have an inspector that's attempting to enforce that 2017 right up on you, mm -hmm. it's not even in place. And there have been multiple customers that I've gone to that said, hey, we need to do this, that, and the other, referencing that document. And I said, well, just hold on a second, because that document's not even in place. You can choose to use it. And he, like John said, humidity is always our friend. It promotes even cooking, it promotes safe cooking, it promotes fast cooking. That's really what that new thing is pushing for. So it's not a bad thing, but if someone's enforcing it on you, uh, specifically that one for jerky is real wild. That one's got some really bold uh, claims and, and uh, requirements in it. Um, it's not 100% necessary to use it right now, but it's not all that bad. There are some good, uh, some good thoughts in it. So yeah, I, generally speaking, I go right to the 1999 one and mm -hmm. time and temp is all in most instances. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, okay, well, that is all the questions that people um, submitted. So I think we will wrap this up. Uh, I am going to send everybody a recording of this tomorrow and a couple links to our panelists. 
um, so you can reach out to them and a short survey. I appreciate everybody's um, attendance. Sorry about the technical difficulties, but we will make sure we have a follow-up webinar with Mike Smucker because I think um, his operator experience would be great to hear from. So thanks again, Collier and John, for your time and hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, bye.